Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we'll talk about human rights with guests. Silvia Agueta, Executive Director of the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles, and John Echohawk, Executive Director of the Native American Rights Fund. So thank you both for joining us. This is a discussion I've really wanted to have for quite a long time because both of your organizations, and there's, there's an ecosystem all around your organizations, all across the nation, you assertively advance human rights in America. So let's talk about the origins of the Legal Aid Foundation first, and then the Native American Rights Fund, and, and talk about your work today. Sylvia, do you wanna kick us off? Thank you, Mark, I appreciate that. And, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, glad to be here with John. So the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles is one of the oldest legal aid organizations in the state of California. We were founded in 1929 during the other major uh, depression that we had in the United States. We were a very small uh, organization that started at um, the University of Southern California by some students and law professors who thought that just because you didn't have um, enough money in your pockets, it should not mean that you should not have access to the courthouse doors. LAFLA has grown from that um, mission of ensuring that people who were having problems with contracts about cows and about uh, employment even back then uh, had lawyers. And it's grown now into an office that is uh, throughout the county of Los Angeles. We have about 180 staff members, um, 85 lawyers on staff, and we help people um, with basically getting into courts, getting their voices heard when they don't have money. We provide free legal services to the poor and low-income people of Los Angeles. It is a need that is much needed, especially now during this pandemic, but LAFLA has always focused its work on various areas. Veterans, we've represented our first veteran in 1943, um, someone who was fighting to get their veterans benefits even back then uh, during World War II. Uh, we've represented um, folks who need housing issues. And that is one of the biggest areas that we do at LAFLA. Housing is one of the major issues, I think, that some of us um, who are housed uh, take for granted. Um, but there are so many unhoused people um, throughout our 90-year our history that it has been um, at the forefront of the work that LAFLA has done. We've expanded our work to represent domestic violence survivors, immigrants, um, in the 80s, LAFLA started an immigration project, which um, was working with Central American um, refugees for the most part, um, helping them um, with their claims as they came to the United States. We've also uh, continued that work now with trafficking victims, um, which unfortunately is, is uh, all too common in, in the world right now. And we continue that work. And John, when, when you look at the history of how laws have been used to impact Native peoples here in this country. Uh, that sort of redress is a very complicated uh, 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 effort. So could you talk a little bit about how, how your organization came to be and, and your thrust? Okay, Mark, uh, uh, thanks for having me here uh, this morning uh, on your program. We uh, always like to uh, talk about our work because most people don't know anything about the Native American issue. We uh, uh, are uh, in our uh, 50th year. We started 50 years ago uh, in 1970. We grew out of the civil rights movement in the 60s where uh, uh, everybody was asserting uh, uh, you know, rights to uh, you know, e equality. But for Native people, what they wanted was treaty rights. Their, their, their rights to you know, uh, continue as uh, sovereign uh, Indian tribes, nations. Uh, the uh, federal policy beginning in the 50s into the 60s was basically to uh, terminate Indian tribes, forget about the treaties, uh, sell our lands, end our reservation, terminate our tribes, send us to the city. We had to be like white people. And that's, they never asked us about that, but that's what they were trying to do to us. So. Uh, that became our focus uh, to uh, assert uh, treaty rights. Of course, uh, you know, as you just said, uh, uh, you got to have uh, 
money for lawyers to go to court and our people were the poorest of the poor. And so we were really pleased in the 1960s when the federal government for the first time, building on what Sylvia was talking about, the you know, private foundations providing uh, legal aid, the federal government through the Office of Economic Opportunity started, started setting up federally funded legal aid offices across the country. And uh, seven of those were set up on Indian reservations. And so they started getting all these young lawyers going out to the reservations, you know, from Harvard and Yale and all these really smart uh, young, young lawyers. And they discovered this uh, federal Indian law too, the treaties and listened to our people. And we want our treaty rights. So they started bringing all these cases under the treaties. And of course, treaties, well, what are they? They're the supreme law of the land. Our rights are recognized in the US Constitution. They say uh, the United States makes treaties with Indian tribes because they're sovereign nations, just like foreign nations, just like states, we're governments. And the federal government deals with us through treaties and treaties are the supreme law of the land. So when those treaties start getting ignored, that's basically illegal. So we started taking these treaties to the court and started enforcing them. I was uh, going through law school uh, in the late 60s as one of the first uh, uh, Native American law students uh, uh, because again, uh, uh, the federal government uh, recognized we didn't have any native lawyers virtually and uh, started providing scholarships for us to go to law school. And so I went to law school and uh, to the credit of, uh, of the faculty there where I went, University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, they put together one of the first courses in federal Indian law. So I learned about all these treaties and rights and other native students I was with, we all agreed our leaders, they don't really know this information. They don't know what's going on. And then we got connected with the legal aid lawyers on the reservation and really saw the potential for all of this. So when I graduated from law school, I worked together with some other lawyers and tribal leaders had the same idea to start the National Indian Legal Defense Fund called the Native American Rights Fund, modeled after the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund. They got their initial funding from the Ford Foundation in New York City. So that's where we went. We went to the Ford Foundation, explained all this and Ford gave us a grant and away we went. We've been uh, litigating these uh, uh, Native American rights cases now for 50 years. It really changed everything. The uh, old Indian termination policy is over. Now the federal government recognizes the, the policy of federal Indian self-determination and our right to exist as, as sovereign nations and it's changed everything. We uh, now have 18 lawyers and three offices and uh, we continue to represent our people. And this, this um, idea of, it's, it's one thing to make laws, it's one thing to legislate, but then there's the whole idea of, of access to the legal system it's, it's being equipped to fight for rights. It's being equipped to, to actually assert a voice. You know, that's really the thing that distinguishes America because the rights are not in, an, in our democracy, they're not reserved for only people um, who are in power. Rights are not reserved only for people who have money. Rights are, are here to be equally enforced, at least in theory. But in order to do that, you have to be able to equalize uh, for people who have less resource versus people who have more. Uh, uh, individuals versus corporations, right? There needs to be some way of, of moving forward. So um, you, you're both, although you are very important organizations, you're small, but you are mighty. So how do you become the, the force that you need to be on behalf of those that you represent, Sylvia. How do you take the limited resources that you have and make sure that they're distributed in a way that has the greatest impact? Because you can't take every case, can you? Not. No, uh, sadly, for every person that seeks our help, we turn one away. We simply don't have the resources. So we attack, and I mean attack, the issues that people are facing, that our clients come to our doors, that so you, select, facing, you select issues based we on have to select the, the leverage and the importance across the community. John, do you do the same thing when you, when you decide to take on an issue? Uh, you can't do everything, right? Your, your group can't do everything. Do you also 
strategically select the the battles that you will uh, fight and and you have to not fight other battles because you just don't have the resource to do everything? Yes, we're very strategic, uh, uh, Mark. We've got a, a, a all Native American uh, board of directors. They set these priorities, the most important issues. So that's what we look for. We get so many requests for assistance. We just focus on these priority issues and uh, select the uh, most important cases that are gonna have had the biggest impact for our people. So your board and your staff, and, and you listen to uh, to the people who you represent. And I guess, Sylvia, do you do the same thing? Do your board, does your board and your staff have these discussions in which you decide what your priorities are going to be in terms of how you use your limited resources? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, tonight they are reviewing the priorities as we do every year um, to make sure that those are the ones that we need to focus on in the coming year. And as you might imagine with the pandemic, we are reviewing them to see should we be shifting or the favorite word pivoting to something else. But in essence, they are always about access to justice. And as John mentioned, you know, we are also um, funded and, and, and because of the creation of the Office of Equal Opportunity, the OEO that created many legal aids, you know, LAFWA has had a mission to ensure that the basic issues like housing, safety, security, um, employment and immigration are, are our priorities because you have to be selective in what you do. You can't do it all. And, and trust me, people come to us with education issues, which we do not do. They come to us with many issues that we simply have to prioritize, as John said, because we can't be everything to everyone. We have to be strategic about what issues we focus on in terms of access to justice. Uh, we, we're in the middle of a, uh, of a poll. Uh, we asked the, the, the very simple question, you know how people talk about the arc of history bending toward justice? We asked whether people believed it. And um, it's interesting, we've got uh, about 18% uh, of the people uh, say that the arc of history favors justice. 35% peop of people feel at this moment in time the arc of history favors injustice. And roughly half believe that the arc of history is neutral and that people can bend the arc of history depending on their actions. Uh, do you feel that, uh, John, that, that you're trying to bend this arc of history in a particular way? And when you, when you look at how you do that and you choose your issues, what are the major issues that you're choosing on behalf of, of Native American rights? Well, our... our uh, um... Priorities are, are, like I said, Mark, been set by our board in uh, uh, number one, the protection of tribal existence. That's our, our sovereignty under our treaties. It's sovereignty, Second, it's culture, right? Uh, well, it's yeah, culture, culture's third, sovereignty's number one. Number two is protection of our homelands, our land base. And third is, is human rights, you know, uh, our protection of our native, uh, native religions and culture. Uh, fourth is holding the government accountable to all the uh, promises they made under the treaties and laws. And fifth is basically doing what we're doing now, and that's educating the public about tribes and uh, developing Indian law. What, what is the importance of having allies that are not necessarily within the legal environment, Sylvia, but are able to either fund you or maybe their allies uh, in getting the word out, as John said, part of this is, is educating the general public. Um, how do you look at developing an ecosystem of, of allies that are not necessarily attorneys, but might bring other gifts to you, to, to your cause? So at LAFLA, we, we very much depend on so many allies that we have. Um, both in government and, uh, frankly, in the nonprofit sector through foundations and the general public. Um, communications is incredibly important for us and getting the word out, as John mentioned, to educate folks about what we do. I think that is can sometimes be the number one issue is making sure that um, the people who need our assistance know about us, are educated about what we do. And in that, we need many allies, whether it's through community-based organizations, which LAFLA has a long history of working in partnership with community-based organizations that focus on a myriad of issues to foundations that need to learn about what we're doing, not just because we're seeking money, but because they can spread the word um, 
far and wide about the services that we provide. Our government partners have come to rely um, on us because they send their constituents to us. Um, cities and counties, and especially now, are really coming to us for assistance with the massive housing crisis that we have in this country. And so for us, we've always developed an ecosystem of partnerships working equally. We like to say at LAFLA, we don't work for clients, we work with them because their voice is equally important to the lawyer voice. If you don't listen to your clients, if you don't work with them and hear what their needs are, even as a case is developing, you're not going to be able to achieve the justice that they need in their cases. So our clients to us, the community as a whole is very important. And we have a unique setup at LAFLA. We have client board members who are full board members of, of the LAFLA Board of Directors, their voice is at the table every time the Board of Directors meets. And they are the ears on the ground. They know exactly what's happening along with our staff, but it's important to always have the voice of the people you're serving um, right in front of you. Otherwise, it's as it might, some might say, it's lawyers coming up with what should we be doing? not at LAFLA. At LAFLA, we focus on our clients and the communities we serve and ensuring that their voice is front and center in everything that we do. So in, in, your, in your sense, as in John's, you're, you're keeping in the center of your sensibility the fact that you serve individuals. You're not a purpose unto yourself. You wanna understand the community needs. You wanna make sure that the community itself is represented on, the, on your board just as John does, uh, because you're, you're not leveraging your skills for a purpose uh, only. You are advancing justice on a very personal level for individuals who must also have a voice in terms of how you do it. That is correct. It's important. The client voice is one of the most important voices in the organization, and we help individuals. We sometimes are able to do it broadly and, and, and change laws and policies. Um, but we need to know what um, our clients with the community-based organizations that work with us think and, and, and assist us in coming up with what should we be focused on. And that's why we do the priority setting to ensure that um, not only the client voice is heard, community voice is heard and that the board can decide what makes sense for the coming year for LAFLA to focus on. They don't change much, I should say, because there, there are some parameters, access to justice, civil rights, human rights, very important. But how we go about doing them, I think, is, is, is what we are focused on to ensure that our clients have the voice that sometimes is very much denied to them. You know, equal justice under law has to be equal, not only in the courthouse, but in what we do and how we practice law. Now, we just completed a poll where we asked when rights have been violated by the government or a business or individual actors, are reparations proper, right? If my landlord is violating my rights and I sue my landlord and I win in court, should the landlord be in some way made to pay me something, a reparation? Or if a treaty right is violated, um, is our, our reparations uh, in order. And we, we had a uh, interesting split. 80% people said yes, 20% of the people uh, say no. So let's talk a little bit about reparations because it's a complicated issue, right? Uh, certainly for native peoples or, um, or African-Americans whose forebears were brought over as slaves. Those are the big, big uh, issues. But it really permeates society. Uh, John, uh, could you just comment on, on your view about the whole reparations uh, question? Uh, yes, uh, uh, for, uh, for tribes, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Congress passed the Indian Claims Commission Act back in the 1940s because of course with the treaties and the negotiation of things, there, there was so much uh, uh, inequity that went on there, uh, you know, tribes weren't really paid uh, adequate compensation for the lands that were taken uh, uh, under the treaties. And, you know, they, they kept some, but still they had to give, give up a lot. And through this Indian Claims Commission process, basically tribes finally got paid something for uh, lands that were taken, you know, without, uh, without just compensation. Uh, so that was really kind of the big one. Uh, these days, you know, we, we, we continue on doing what we can and reparations, uh, are possible occasionally. We happen to have been involved in the largest reparation case in the history of the United States. 
the largest judgment against the United States, $3.4 billion in a class action case uh, brought on behalf of uh, individual Indians uh, uh, for uh, uh, mismanagement of their Indian trust accounts. Basically, Mark, our lands are held in trust for us by the federal government under the treaties. They have the legal title, we have the beneficial title. That makes the federal government a trustee. And you know what trustees do? They're like our, our banker. You know, they've got uh, fiduciary obligations. And so whenever we uh, lease our lands for uh, any kind of development or something, the, uh, the money goes to the federal government. They collect that money for us and hold us in, in hold that in accounts for us, trust accounts. And of course, you know, they're supposed to invest that and, you know, report to us, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, the federal government never really did a very good job of that. You know, it, a bunch of bureaucrats with no money and no expertise. And basically these, these accounts got all fouled up, but we never got accountings. They didn't invest it properly on and on. And we just kept complaining about this for decades. And Congress always said, yeah, this is wrong. We're going to fix it. We're going to fix it. And they never did. And so finally, uh, uh, some of those uh, people called us, okay, could you bring uh, an, a big case against the federal government on behalf of all of us for uh, mismanagement of uh, our trust funds? Okay, so boy, here we went. It took us 14 years, all kinds of litigation, uh, you know, uh, squabbling in the Congress and anyway, finally, under the Obama administration, we finally got a settlement, $3.4 billion. And, and uh, Sylvia, when you, when you look at people who are getting involved with you, uh, very often they don't have the time to, to spend in court. Uh, you know, people have to be at work. Um, mm -hmm. And then if they win the case, um, you know, there, there's so much investment in actually executing a case and trying to assert your rights. How do you feel about this whole idea of, of uh, some sort of redress and, and how does that unfold in your work? Do people really ever get healed in, in terms of financially when they assert their rights? I think it's a, it's a difficult uh, question because, you know, when you lose your home and which is the issue we're facing right now is a lot of um, evictions taking place. Um, you can You can hopefully stop the eviction, but the trauma that our clients suffer with just knowing that they could lose their home, they could end up on their street, their children could be out there with them or seniors. Um, that, that emotional toll that it takes that I, I think that when we talk about reparations, every case is about reparations. It's just that we don't say it when it's a corporation getting reparations from, a, from either the government or another corporation. It's only when I think it's folks who have generally been considered not um, corporate actors or others that we talk about reparations and every case has a remedy, um, but is, does the remedy make you whole? I think in some cases it can financially make you whole, but for example, take the case of a domestic violence survivor. They can get uh, the restraining order against the abuser. They can get um, child support uh, for their children, but making the client whole is, is another story. And I think it's only part of the story. So the monetary remedy can be there, but it's the toll that it takes on someone as a human being. And I think that's where I'm very proud of the staff at LAFLA because we look at clients holistically and what their needs are. We've worked with social workers to ensure that they can uh, work with them as they move forward in their lives, that they get the, the needed counseling because it isn't just about the economic uh, remedy, which is important um, for, for the poor and low-income people um, uh, that we represent absolutely necessary, but it doesn't necessarily always make you whole. And we have to look beyond the financial remedy into what else can we do as an organization to put them um, in touch with social workers, work with um, other uh, entities that can hopefully begin to um, make people whole. It's very difficult. You know, I think um, the toll, the, the, the psychological toll that being poor takes on, on, on on folks is something that is not often talked about and um, something that um, we need to deal with as, as a country, um, but definitely as a nonprofit legal organization, we see it every single day. And that's why we've gone beyond the case help and work that we do. We also talk about what is the social um, uh, 
impact that these cases have on our clients because it does take a toll every single day. We see it. We see it in them. And we also see the triumph when we win a case and someone feels like somebody finally was on their side working with them to begin a new chapter in their lives. You know, we, we know people come to us at the worst moment in their lives. And that's why we're here um, to, to work with them to make sure that not only are their court cases handled, but that beyond that, we look at our clients as a whole, as a human being, rather than just case number 10. I feel, I, I feel like we have so much more to talk about, but we're coming to the end of our time. We just completed a poll that I'd like uh, you each to comment on. We asked whether um, the respondents believe that Americans' focus on human rights as an issue is affected by which political party has power. This is something that's always disturbed me because America ought to be constant in our fight for justice and human rights. But the respondents basically felt that, it, that depending on which political party is in power, there's either, either an emphasis or, or a de-emphasis on, on uh, justice. Uh, John, could you talk a little bit about this, this um, situation from your perspective? Because whether it's been a two or a three party system that we've had in this country over history, um, I personally don't see that, um, that native peoples have been treated uh, with more or, or less justice. It just seems to be a, a uh, historical arc of, of injustice and violence um, uh, that, that needs to be changed. And I think that, that power is shifting in the country um, in, in a way that allows uh, Native people to more successfully assert their rights, as you have uh, outlined. But how do you see this, the, the, the development of, of American politics in terms of justice? As I said at the outset, Mark, ever since uh, 1970, when uh, the uh, federal policy of, uh, of uh, termination of tribes was changed to uh, uh, set, you know, self Indian self determination, where tribes could determine for themselves their future and uh, you know maintain their uh, uh, their treaty rights and their land and culture and identity. Uh, uh, we've had a pretty good run there for 50 years, and 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 uh, all the administrations have supported that that policy. All the Congresses, uh, it's just that uh, from time to time, different administrations or different Congresses will uh, be more supportive or less supportive. Of, uh, of those issues kind of kind of depending on what they are uh, currently uh, under this administration we've, we've had uh, uh, several instances where this administration has not been uh, uh, supportive of uh, of the tribes on some issues so that's led uh, us to bring some some more cases you know litigation over those issues that are that are pending in court now and uh, with uh, with the recent election change in administrations now we think we have a good chance of basically uh, uh, setting those cases now and, and reversing what was uh, what was done to the tribes in several instances. So it, it just kind of depends uh, on, on the different administrations, Congresses, elections, and, and it just, it, you never can tell. You just have to see how it goes. But you don't see a particular pattern is what you're saying. You, you know, sometimes it's better, sometimes it's worse, but there's not a particular pattern in terms of a uh, political party. No, no, not really. And, and Sylvia, how do you see this in terms of uh, our politics and how they intersect with, with, with rights? Do you feel like it really matters uh, which of the political parties um, uh, is in power in terms of its focus on human rights from your perspective? I think for us, it, it, it depends. Um, I, I echo what, what John said, is that it depends on what Congress is, is doing and, and, and working on. Um, I think that in this administration, it has been tougher if you're an immigrant, for example. Um, and um, if you are a poor person trying to get food stamps, you know, there have been attacks on the food stamp program um, that we haven't seen in the past. But then again, um, it, it, and I say it depends because it was, 
you know, the administration of Richard Nixon that created the Legal Services Corporation, uh, which is one of the biggest funders for legal aid in the country. And so I think it just depends on what the focus becomes of an administration. I think recently, um, particularly in this administration, you know, programs that assist um, poor people, whether it's social security, food stamps, um, or even housing have been under attack and have made it much harder. Uh, but other administrations um, have made it, um, have have allowed for um, the funding of legal services um, and for the creation of different programs. I think um, many times it really is what is the focus of that particular administration rather than the party. Um, although, you know, you know, it was the war on poverty as, as articulated by um, the, the Johnson administration that created most of the legal aid programs and began the OEO program. But I, I do think it's been a tough, it's been a tough four years. Well, uh, I'll let you have the last uh, word, Sylvia. This has just been a great, great discussion. There's so much more we can we can chat about. You know, it just seems to me uh, in listening to you both, America is only as good as our as access to our to justice. And so this this idea of us all being actively engaged in ensuring that justice is equally applied across different peoples and that we pay attention to the laws, that uh, everyone has a voice uh, and everybody gets heard is so important. Thank you so much, uh, Sylvia Agueta, John Echo Hawk. Uh, that's the nonprofit port, everyone. Thank you so much for attending, attendees. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your participation in the polls. Please mask up, everyone stay safe and have a, have a wonderful uh, holiday season as we, as we enter that time of year.